welcome back to Radio Free Guest Area, the internet's number one source for just good enough historical content. I've been making these videos since March 2020 um, when we had to go online because of the virus, obviously. Um, and at the time, I've got to be perfectly honest, um, I did think that this was going to go on for a while, um, longer than the two weeks or month, two months that maybe um, government authorities had, had projected or implied. But I did not, honestly did not realize it was going to go on for months. Um, we're in December 2021 when um, the Omicron variant, um, following close on the heels of the Delta variant, is wreaking havoc all over the world. and seeming to put people into a situation in which things could be in some ways as bad as they've ever been as far as the COVID virus is concerned, but people are just getting really tired and exhausted. The political world has been exhausted to um, provide social welfare or support for businesses or um, support for lockdowns. It really feels like Groundhog Day, and it's going to for a while. So this really raises a question of whether um, global capitalism, um, this wonderful world of globalization that we've been told since the at least the 1990s, um, is the true and only heaven. This is perfect, just in time manufacturing, global trade, supply chains, all this. Uh, what if we made everything as close to the margin as possible in the smallest amounts possible to create the maximum efficiency? And what if nothing ever went wrong? Um, it's more than a supply chain problem, though. I really have some, some questions about how... Um, Capitalism and liberal democracy, as we understand it in <coughs> North America, Europe, Japan, um, other countries of the world, um, whether we have the social resources, not just like resources like food, water, energy, but like the social um, wherewithal to actually deal with this. Um, we all know that climate change is a term um, threat to the economic system that we've been using since the early 19th century, but it seems like COVID um, has, has es escalated and accelerated that. Um, and I really do not know how we will come out of it. I think the form of capitalism that will come out of this is going to be uh, pretty distinctive and different from what we know. And this brings me back to thinking about the last time that global capitalism was under um, this kind of um, systemic threat, which I would say is 2008-2009. At the time, um, in the winter of 2008, it was a scary time. Uh, I remember sitting in my car doing alternate side parking in New York City, um, a very specific ritual to that city, um, I guess alternate side parking is the same place, but um, just sitting there listening to the president-elect Barack Obama speak on the radio about what they're going to do about um, the economy, but that president was not going to be taking office for like a month or so, um, and just being really scared about what was going to happen. I've lost my job. Um, I didn't know what the future was going to hold. It seemed like the global system of capitalism was under its biggest sort of um, challenge that had existed basically in my lifetime. I mean, I grew up in the age of kind of the post-Cold War um, triumphalism that capitalism was always going to be the perfect thing. And um, there's no alternative, Tina, that whole like Margaret Thatcher thing, and Reagan, and Bill Clinton, right? Um, at that time, um, 
my um, grandmother had passed away in December 2008, and she was somebody who was very important to me and a very close person, very significant figure in my life. Uh, she passed away unexpectedly. Um, the world seemed to be in shambles. I was feeling like a pretty melancholic butterfly. Um, when New Year's uh, Eve 2008, um, New Year's Day 2009, um, I remember thinking about this song by um, the musician Joe Holland. Mexican Flute. And um, it's a long song, and <clears throat> in some ways you could say it's maybe kind of a dirge. I mean, it's it's a very sort of moody, lengthy song that meditates on themes of loss and, um, and grief. And she's talking about someone she's lost, right? Um, it begins with the lines, you're like a saint's song to me. I'll try to sing it pure and easily. You're like a Mexican blue, too bright and clear, pale in the afternoon. And it goes on. Um, and when you dreamed, my guardian spirits appeared and the moon stretched out across your little bed. They said they started to get worried about me. They were happy we finally met. We had finally met. A mysterious bird flies away, seems to be calling your name. He bounced off the top of a towering pine and vanished in the drizzling rain. There's a mockingbird behind my house who is a magician of the highest degree, and I swear I heard him rip the world apart and sew it back again with his fiery melody. And finally, you know, she speaks of the person that's gone. Um, I love your songs, I love your sound, everything is so much better when you're around. When the moon is as clear as an opal and the amethyst river sings its song, I'll remember all your dreams and your mysteries, your form, your crystalline soul that you sing from your golden throat, that you shine with your sparkling eyes. This is a way of talking about someone that is gone, that you lost, who's beautiful, and they're never coming back. Um, she talks about the mockingbird um, that is a magician of the highest degree, and that bird, you know, if you've ever heard a mockingbird, it's not necessarily the greatest sound. Um, I swear I heard him rip the world apart and sew it back again with his fiery melody. The world has been torn asunder, and there's a stream that will meet you halfway. <clears throat> Which is anyone, you know, who's lost someone, is something that you can probably understand, that you want the world to be put back together again. It's been fixed, but you also know that it will never be fixed. So that's, I mean, that's the last time that I really remember um, our whole economic and social system being put under the kind of pressure um, that it is now. And actually, I mean, I think it's greater now. You could say the financial crisis of 2008 was actually more of a systemic problem because it was grounded in, like, actual flaws in, I don't know. The housing market, all that, like, our markets, our capitalist system in itself was maybe not in as much danger as it was then, but COVID is a, um, is a black swan. It's um, something new. So what Jolie Holland was talking about in her 2006 album with the song Mexican Blue was about grief. And the question is, for so many of us who've lost people in our lives, who've suffered in our families or our jobs, um, who've lost um, our, our home, maybe, or we've just lost a way of life that we're, we were used to, uh, we are all experiencing a new level of grief. And what do you do with grief, right? That's, that's the question. I mean, grief is about losing something that's gone, that's never going to come back. And it really makes me think of this book by um, the late scholar uh, Svetlana Boym called uh, The Future of Nostalgia, which was published in 2001. What um, Boym is talking about, it's, it's such a rich and complex book, and I read it, I think, maybe the first semester of grad school, and I just has always made an impact on me. I think it's such a profound 
unusual look. I mean, Boyn was talking about, like, she's herself a Russian expatriate who came from the USSR to the U.S., um, and she's writing about Nabokov and these other authors who are kind of, like, <coughs> dealing with their own conflicted feelings about um, the homeland that they left and, and, for the most part, could never go back to. And Boyn talks about this idea of nostalgia, which is a very interesting one. Nostalgia um, in the 18th or 19th century was actually considered to be an actual disease, like, you know, um, multiple sclerosis, sorry, sclerosis, um, or, um, you know, HIV, or cancer, nostalgia. Um, it came from Greek root words um, that meant, um, let's see, um, nostos, which means um, to return home, and algos, which means pain. Alga, fibromyalgia, analgesics, those words come from this word for pain. So the feeling of pain that people feel when they've left home, homesickness, really, but it was considered to be kind of a disease in the same way maybe that neurasthenia was considered to be a disease at the time in the 19th century or 18th century. And so Boyne was talking about this idea of nostalgia, and it's a longing for a place that never existed, really. When we think about the past and we long for the past, we're, we think we're longing for something that actually existed, but in a very significant sense, what we're longing for is something that never existed. It's our idealized version of it, or maybe it's an idealized version of something we never experienced in the way that sort of ethno-nationalism in many ways um, imagines a foregone era when the, the people, the folk, or whatever, was um, unified and pure. and That's something you've never experienced. <clears throat> it's not even like being sad and homesick about like the home that you're idealizing. It's about something you've never experienced. It's very interesting how Boyne looks at this. I mean, she's looking at it from a sort of um, post-communist point of view, which is her own experience, and I think, you know, extremely powerful. But she's taking it back quite a bit. And so she talks about how um, this idea of nostalgia um, is something of modernity. Um, for one, for example, think about the way that during COVID, we've all kind of talked about time and how time is different. Like, we can't remember when anything happened. Time speeds up and slows down. Everything just seems like it's in a time fog. Um, I think that's a pretty broadly shared experience among a lot of people. Uh, Boyum, in the introduction to her book, talks about um, how um, time became part of modernity as early as the 13th century. This is like the early stages of uh, early modernity. And Boehm writes, before the invention of mechanical clocks in the 13th century, the question, what time is it, was not very urgent. Certainly there were plenty of calamities, but the shortage of time was not one of them. Therefore, people could exist, quote, in an attitude of temporal ease. Neither time nor change appeared to be critical, and hence there was no great worry about controlling the future. So, you know, she's talking about a pre-modern um, mentality that when the mechanical clock or this sort of um, mechanized, precise uh, parsing out of time came along, changed things. So modernity is very oriented toward like progress and uh, teleological movement toward the future. And maybe in a pre-modern era, that was not as clear because there wasn't this very specific way of dealing with and so she's talking about the 13th century here, which is before the era of European imperialism. But in a lot of ways, um, nostalgia was a, 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 a symptom of, of, of European expansion. Um, that, you know, if you were a peasant from um, Manchester or, um, you know, Poland or wherever, like you or Tuscany, you were dislocated brought to the quote-unquote new world, 
um, far away from family that you maybe will never see again. I mean, there was some circular migration, um, especially in like the 19th and early 20th century. But if you're going to the New World, you might be, whether that's Argentina, Australia, um, the United States, Canada, you might be leaving your people forever. And that's an experience of not just modernity, but of imperialism and colonialism. So like nostalgia, this longing for home, this fantasizing about home, this fantasizing about what we've lost, um, is kind of specific, culturally specific to um, the experience of um, imperialism and colonialism, I would argue. Now what um, Form says is so interesting. She says, and I quote, Nostalgia shared some symptoms with melancholia and hypochondria. Melancholia, according to the Galenic conception, was a disease of the black bile that affected the blood and produced such physical and emotional symptoms as, quote, vertigo, much wit, headache, much waking, rumbling in the guts, troublesome dreams, heaviness of the heart, continuous tear, sorrow, discontent, superfluous cares, and anxiety. I don't know how much wit is a um, symptom of the disease. Um, it's not good, obviously. Uh, but this is talking about like an actual physical manifestation of depression or sadness, melancholia, right? People thought about nostalgia the same way. Um, for Robert Burton, melancholia, far from being a mere physical or psychological condition, had a philosophical dimension. The melancholic saw the world as a theater ruled by capricious fate and demonic players, often mistaken for a mere misanthrope, the melancholic was in fact a utopian dreamer who had higher hopes for humanity. So melancholia is a sadness um, in the sense about hoping for better and being frustrated by its lack. In this respect, melancholia was an affect and an ailment of intellectuals, a Hamletian doubt a side effect of critical reason. In melancholia, thinking and feeling, spirit and matter, soul and body, were perpetually in conflict. And this is what Boyne argues. Unlike melancholia, which was regarded as an ailment of monks and philosophers, nostalgia was a more, quote, democratic disease that threatened to affect soldiers and sailors displaced far from home, as well as many country people who began to move to the cities. So this is actually like very much a part of, again, um, this industrialization, urbanization, imperialism, colonialism. You might be leaving a small village in rural Poland to go to Warsaw, or you might be doing the same to go to London. Um, so that's an internal migration, or you might be going overseas. But <clears throat> this is something, when she uses the word more democratic, it's like, Melancholia might be something that these like poets who are taking laudanum and like just brooding and one of the garrets making galwas cigarettes like that might be their thing, but this nostalgia is something that affected the masses because there's so many people on the move who have left home and were hurt and they were in pain from losing home and then this idea of home develops in their mind that might not be exactly mapped onto the real home that existed. And that could be your small village when you move to the city, or it could be um, your nation or your culture when you move to another continent. As Boyne says, nostalgia was not merely an individual anxiety, but a public threat that revealed the contradictions of modernity and acquired a greater, greater political importance. what Boehm has to show us is an understanding about how the um, sort of vicissitudes and turmoil of early modernity, um, capitalism, globalization created the sense in people of like a grief, a grief for something that may have existed, but most of the time didn't, I guess. Um, creating 
what Benedict Anderson would describe as imagined communities. Like, there's the France that I love. There's the Israel that has always existed. There's this place I'm coming from, which in many ways, in most ways, never really existed, but <clears throat> this uh, coalescence of identity around um, something you feel like you've lost. And I think that's very apt for this moment that we're in, where um, I would suggest that we're in a crisis of capitalism and modernity now, and globalization, um, that we've all lost something. When people talk about the quote before time, there's a clear marker. It's almost like BC, AD, or C, BC, D, that there's this dividing line between, or like in um, Brave New World, before Ford and after Ford. <clears throat> it seems like there's a before COVID and after COVID. And everybody kind of feels it. We know what life was like before, or we think we do. Like it's already fa like fading into the haze. Um, we have memories for sure, but the way we reconstruct them and think about them and the way we compare them to the present is very uh, unreliable and contingent. But we all still feel this. So even if it's not a loss of um, a, a parent or a sibling or a child, uh, an aunt or an uncle, which many of us have experienced in these ways, um, there's a bigger grief about um, the loss of something that we had before. And that results in a kind of nostalgia. And I think that in the period of time of COVID, um, nostalgia is going to become an ailment in much the way it was in the 18th, 19th centuries when people were pretty disrupted and dislocated um, because of the churning forces of imperialism and sort of the spread of capitalism. We're moving into a different place now. But I do think that, um, I think Svetlana Boym has a lot to say about it. And there are many other writers, scholars, philosophers, thinkers who've talked about grief. There's so much to, to read and learn about that. But I think viewing it through the lens of Boym's um, ideas about nostalgia, I think is very helpful in understanding how this strange new world that we're in now is not the same, but maybe uh, harmonizes or rhymes or is analogous to uh, disruptions of the past. And the thing that matters most is not the past that we think that we have, it's the future that we hope that we can create, which is obviously heavily influenced by our idea of what the past was. But sometimes with grief, you just have to accept that things are gone it's over. Um, as soon as we get to that point, we'll have a better and clearer idea of what the future looks like. Anyway, thank you for listening to this extremely long-winded, pretentious, and stupid um, sort of peroration. It's, it's such an annoying term. It's like something George Will would say, but um, anyway, these are just what I'm thinking. Um, Thank you for tuning in to Radio Free Gastonia, and um, we'll see you the next time we're talking about coronavirus, because we've been here for a while. All right. Have a good night. Bye.